I had occasion, Madam Chair, to uh, craft last night in what I think is the legal framework uh, for, for the discussions at yesterday's and then possibly today's uh, proceedings. And these are just really my initial thoughts. We're still coming from a position where facts are yet to be completely established and where accountability is yet to be conclusively determined. Now on the part of the DOJ, as the primary criminal investigative and prosecutorial agency of the government, we still have a long way to go before those criminally responsible in the incident are brought to justice. But we will arrive there one way or the other. In the meantime, what I can offer now is a legal framework from which to approach the various issues that have cropped up in the course of discussions on the incident, including those already raised at yesterday's hearing. The foremost legal question, and I think this becomes really very, very relevant in, in light of, of the letter of uh, Mr. Iqbal, the foremost legal question that has arisen in this incident is the legal implication of the peace process on the criminal liability and administrative accountability of those involved in the incident. As stated yesterday, proceeding from a purely constitutional and legal standpoint, criminal liability on the part of the MILF in this case might not be different from ordinary situations where a crime was committed and that perpetrators who are identified are criminally liable unless they're able to successfully invoke either exempting or justifying circumstances. Administrative liability of those on the government side, however, is different. The peace process has generated a set of agreements, as everyone knows, on the cessation of hostilities between the government and the MILF. These agreements have been integrated in the operational guidelines of the AFP and PNP for law enforcement. Any violation of these guidelines should necessarily entail administrative liability. We have to contend with the fact that government security forces have bound themselves to observing certain rules of conduct in military and law enforcement operations under the regime of the peace negotiations and are therefore subject to disciplinary measures in the event of willful violation of these rules of conduct. And in any legal framework, the Constitution reigns supreme, as aptly articulated yesterday by Senator Gringo. Now, this is followed, of course, by the laws passed by the legislature and their interpretations as passed upon by the Supreme Court. Now, the question is, where does the peace negotiation and uh, resulting peace agreements figure in this legal regime? Now, my take on the matter, Your Honors, again, these are just really my preliminary thoughts, is that the GPH MILF agreements bind the parties to their terms as parties to a contract. And as a contract, it is therefore the law between the parties, but not the law of the country. Non-compliance with the terms of the agreement is a matter between the GPH and the MILF as negotiating parties. So in case of violations in the peace agreement, I see no legal sanctions on the part of the government, only political repercussions on the trust and goodwill between the two parties. On the other hand, in case of violations by the MILF, the, G the GPH, the government, may choose to apply the peace mechanisms on cessation of hostilities as agreed upon between the parties or proceed to apply the law, in this case the criminal law, on political crimes such as rebellion or ordinary crimes such as murder and direct assault. It can also choose to apply both, modifying its application of the law on criminal liability with any political settlement it can arrive at with the MILF in the future. In short, given this framework, the government, I submit, has two tracks in, approach, in, in approaching the issue on criminal liability. It can approach it as the enforcer of the duly promulgated laws of the state or as a party to a contract or agreement with the MILF. Or it can approach this issue from the perspective of both 
that is as the law enforcer and as a peace partner. The two, I submit, are not mutually exclusive. Applied separately, there would of course be political repercussions, especially if the approach is from a purely law enforcement or criminal liability standpoint for the mere reason that the other party relies on the government to honor its commitments to the peace agreement. There is nothing in the uh, GPH MILF peace agreement instrument stating that in case any offense is committed by an MILF member in relation to rebellion or any other political crime, more so a common crime, during the regime of cessation of hostilities, the GPH is committed to suspend or forgo cr regular criminal proceedings against the MILF member and instead refer the same to the proper body created by the parties. Because as I mentioned yesterday, the laws, our laws do not stop to operate under a peace process or under a peace regime. Now the closest commitment that can be relied to, I, I, I was going over the various documents, is the implementing operational guidelines of the GRP MILF agreement on the general cessation of hostilities that was adopted in November 14, 1997. This agreement provides, I quote, it shall be the responsibility of the GRP and MILF to take immediate and necessary actions to stop any violation and punish respective forces who violate this implementing guidelines and ground rules, end of quote, and that, quote, the GRP and MILF will take appropriate actions on their respective forces who violate this implementing guidelines and ground rules, end of quote. Now, does this mean that a state commits to forgo criminal prosecution and leave the matter to the MILF who shall take appropriate action against its erring members. For purposes of confidence building measures, this might be a commitment that the GPH would want to keep. But in legal terms, no law prevents the GPH from exercising its power to arrest and prosecute criminal offenders regardless of an existing peace agreement that has no clear provision on the suspension of criminal action against political or common crimes committed by members of its peace partner during the peace process or negotiations. It can still proceed, of course, with arrest and prosecution, but the same will heavily impact on confidence building measures, if not put an end to the peace negotiations or agreement altogether, but God forbid. Even assuming there is such an agreement on immunities, the same is only the law between the parties entered into for confidence building measures. It is not the law of the state passed by Congress that has a mandatory and punitive effect in case of violation. Nothing in the laws of the Philippines would still prevent the state from not complying with this agreement on immunity to rebel negotiators but of course at the risk of the other party withdrawing from the negotiations based on loss of sincerity, credibility, and trustworthiness of the GPH in pursuing negotiations. Because among the papers I saw, your honors, is that whatever security guarantee there is to the MILF in the peace uh, negotiations involves only safe passage and immunity from searches and seizures, including arrest, but only to those directly involved in the peace negotiations. That's, that's, the, that's the limit of the immunity or whatever immunity provisions are there and, uh, and at present. Now, assuming also that the MILF did not notify the GPH panel of the presence in MILF area of criminal elements listed in the AFP PNP order of battle, and I'm assuming that there is such a list because it, it's, it's in, the, in, in the instruments that the GPH will submit to the MILF an order of battle or list of targets. Now, the same, if there is no such notification, the same shall be elevated to the GPH MILF peace panels for disposition as an act of non-compliance with the terms of the peace agreement on cessation of hostilities. However, 
approached from a purely criminal liability perspective, knowingly harboring a criminal, assisting a criminal, obstructing law enforcement operations for his arrest and otherwise aiding in the escape of the targets are criminal offenses which may be prosecuted by the government in the performance of its role as the enforcer of the laws of the state. And approach from a purely government law enforcement perspective, the criminal liability of the MILF members involved may be discussed in the, in the following manner, only again as a matter of academic discussion because we don't have yet the full facts. Since MILF members who commit criminal offenses during the regime of cessation of hostilities are not immune from investigation, arrest, and prosecution under the agreements, the only way they can be exempted from criminal liability for the political crime of rebellion and ordinary crimes of homicide, murder, direct assault, etc., is under the provisions of the revised penal code on who are exempted from criminal liability. The exempting circumstance possibly relevant I know which exempting and justifying circumstances are possibly relevant uh, to the incident, in this incident. But because of the still incomplete and hazy facts, I would rather not uh, express which are or what are the applicable exempting and justifying circumstances, lest I'll be accused of preempting the investigation or even uh, lawyering for any, any side or anyone. I have a discussion on those, but I, I, I cannot share this at the moment. Now, on the other hand, and, and by the way, whatever defenses they would have would have to be presented or would have to be tr proven during trial if and when uh, it, it reaches that stage. But it does not exempt, in the meantime, the liable MILF members from investigation, arrest, and prosecution. On the other hand, if approached from the perspective of the government as a peace partner in a peace agreement or as the state actor in a non-international armed conflict, as, as uh, manifested earlier by Professor Ferrer, or as the state actor in a non-international armed conflict, the criminal liability of the MILF can be limited to that of a non-state actor. This would mean, again, just an, for academic purposes, limiting criminal prosecution of the MILF to possible violations of humanitarian law as adopted from the Geneva Convention on War Crimes as integrated in Republic Act 9851, which is the Philippine IHL law. This implies recognition of the status of the MILF as a non-state actor involved in a non-international armed conflict. And from this perspective, I should say that criminal liability can be approached in this manner. We have what we have or what we had was a law enforcement operation, a legitimate law enforcement operation because, because it was for the implementation of outstanding warrants of arrest. But while initially a, a law enforcement operation, it gone awry, escalating into an armed conflict between government security forces and a non-state actor, enforcing a recognized defensive or protective position and therefore may not be liable for ordinary criminal conduct, but only for criminal war conduct as a non-state actor under RA 9851. I'm careful enough to really phrase it as just may not be liable, because again, I do not want to make any categorical legal statement at the moment. This does not mean, however, that the agreement on, on a cessation of hostilities has already been terminated and that the forces have now reverted to a state of armed conflict once again. Neither side have made, have made any pronouncement or declaration that there is now resumption of hostilities. That is the only way we can assume there is such if there is a formal declaration by either side. At the moment, there is none. So, uh, so uh, as I said, this does not mean that the agreement on cessation of hostilities has already been terminated and that the forces have now reverted to a state of armed conflict once again. 
Far from this. It's far from this. The situation presents a factual, classic example of a violation of the terms and conditions of a peace agreement, which only calls for the operation of the mechanisms put in place in case of violations, but definitely not the ipso facto termination of the peace terms and reversion to a state of harm to armed hostilities. And finally, any general amnesty that may be proclaimed in the future as part of the conclusion of the transitional agreements of the peace process or negotiations will have the effect of extinguishing all criminal liability in relation to covered crimes, generally political crimes or crimes related to rebellion, but not to common crimes. As to the criminal liability of the BIFF and other private armed groups which participated in the attack against the PNP and PNP SAF, the same is unqualified by any extenuating circumstance such as an existing peace agreement or agreement with the government. Said groups are therefore liable to the fullest extent of the law for the range of possible crimes that they have committed during the Mama Sapano incident without any possible application of exempting or justifying circumstances that are otherwise still or may be available to the MILF. This is for the simple reason that the BIFF and the PAGs themselves are per se illegal associations already engaged in criminal activities as defined under Article 147 of the Revised Penal Code even before the encounter with the PNP and therefore cannot, under any contemplated situation, invoke any exempting or justifying circumstance. Now, very briefly now, as uh, in, 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 in uh, conclusion, in, in, uh, as a final uh, portion of, of my position, we now go to the possible liability of government officials involved in the incident. As stated, nothing in our laws declares the act of government of non-compliance with peace agreements as criminal or illegal per se, so long as it is the adopted policy of the state as official government action. However, if willful non-compliance with the peace terms or termination of the peace agreement is not state or government policy, and what we have is a violation of the peace terms by individual public officials, said public officials may be administratively and even criminally liable. The various GPH MILF agreements on the cessation of hostilities provide for the procedure on how arrests may be made by the AFPPNP in MILF defined areas or communities. These agreements on the cessation of hostilities provide that police and military actions throughout Mindanao shall continue, including the arrests of criminals. And of course, we now know that there are provisions on prior coordination and prior and, and notice about presence of, uh, of, of uh, targets in, in MILF areas, etc. In implementing these agreements, the AFPPNP drew up operational guidelines, assuming that the GPH MILF procedure was not followed by individual PNP AFP officials. This subjects the commander's concern to administrative sanctions for non-compliance with the joint AFP-PNP revised operational guidelines for the AJAG. The administrative charges could either be gross insubordination or misconduct in the performance of official duties. Full compliance and bid for these operational guidelines would also justify the hesitance of the AFP <coughs> to fully unleash its force and destructive resources in order to rescue or come to the aid of the concerned PNP force. We have heard yesterday, General Katapang, the AFP was still mindful of the terms on cessation of hostilities with the MILF. It chose to follow the operational guidelines and decided not to compound a mistake with another one. Now, the administrative liability of public officials, however, may still involve criminal liability if the official participation or if the official participating in the execution of the law enforcement operation was not authorized by law 
to be part of the official decision-making apparatus of the government. The PNP, as if it was a military organization, would base this on the principle of the on the chain of command. However, approach from a purely civilian agency standpoint, not subject to military law, military justice, or military courts, the administrative and criminal liability of the PNP officials concerned should more properly be addressed using ordinary civil service rules for civilian agencies and the regular criminal justice system intended for civilians. As such, administrative liability may include grave misconduct and or insubordination, and criminal liability may include usurpation of authority as penalized, penalized under Article 177 of the Revised Penal Code. May I just say this for the appreciation of everyone? Some people may not agree with this. The concept of a chain of command is a military construct. Clearly, it applies to the AFP as a military organization of the state, but does it likewise apply to a purely civilian, albeit armed agency of the state, such as the PNP? According to the 1987 Constitution, I quote, the state shall establish and maintain one police force which shall be national in scope and civilian in character to be administered and controlled by a national police commission. The authority of local executives over the police units in their jurisdiction shall be provided by law. That's section, 16, uh, section 6, Article 16 of the Constitution. The PNP is not a military organization subject to the chain of command concept, strictly speaking. It is a purely civilian agency under a civilian NAPOLCOM with the president exercising administrative control and supervision over the DILG secretary and the NAPOLCOM as the chief executive and not as the commander in chief. As such, liabilities of PNP officials are determined using civil service rules and regulations applicable and common to all civilian agencies as enforced by the NAPOLCOM on members of the PNP and not military law or court martials as enforced under the military justice system, the latter being applicable only to the members of the AFP. May I submit those thoughts, Madam Chair, Madam. for the committee's appreciation. Thank you.